Hey, everybody. Andrew Kraus here, InventRight co-founder. Uh, Stephen Key and myself, we co-founded InventRight 20-plus years ago. We've been coaching and mentoring inventors ever since. I am fresh back from a camping vacation, and that's, that's the reason normally we do these Q&As on Wednesday night Pacific time at 5, 10 p.m., and today we're doing it at 11 a.m. on a Thursday Pacific time. So I don't know how much, how many people we're going to get attending, um, but we're going to have some fun here. Uh, I'm a little bit sore. Last night I slept, well, night before last night, I slept on a very bumpy camping mattress. Um, besides that, it was absolutely gorgeous um, where we were, camped right along the river. It was beautiful, very, very peaceful. I recommend uh, getting out in nature and, and camping if you guys are into that. Um, so... Just to give you guys a heads up for those of you that are new, um, at InventRight, let me move this camera. You can see my light switch there. It's got to look perfect, right? There we go. Let's move that over there a little bit. There we go. Um, so at InventRight, what we're all about is licensing. So let me move that down a little bit more. There we go. Okay. We're, we're all about licensing. And what licensing is is selling your ideas for uh, royalties or renting your ideas for royalties. So you – you don't license to a retailer, you license to a manufacturer that sells at a retailer or the equivalent for a commercial product. Um, and what they're doing is taking all the risks. So it's, it's their money, it's their workforce, and it's their existing distribution. So if they're in 30,000 stores, you're in 30,000 stores. You're using their money, not your money, um, and you're using their workforce, not yours. So you're essentially renting them your idea, and then you get paid royalties quarterly, Every three months, so as they sell and make money, you make money. And your product is maybe maybe one in 50 of their products, but you're plugging your product into their machine, their machine. So with licensing, what you're doing is you're tapping into everything that's already there, the money, the workforce, and the distribution. I talked to a gentleman this morning, very nice guy, but he, with the product he came up with, he was trying to create new distribution channels. You don't really want to do that with licensing. You want to tap into what's already there. So Whenever you come up with your idea, go, well, well, how is that product sold and who is already selling products in that space so they can just, it's just one more product in their product line. And so what's beautiful about that is you're piggybacking off of what they're doing. And that's huge. And so you don't need to start a business. You keep a day job. You keep your other business. You can do this on the side. And you can let them take all that financial risk and spend all the time running the business. So that's what we do here at InventRight. We do licensing. And we've had students in over 65 countries um, over the last 20 plus years. I need to see when we hit 21. We'll be able to drink, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so that's a terrible joke. Uh, uh, Fred, let's just start at the top here. Fred says, I'm very excited to see Stephen Key. Hmm. Thanks, Fred. Well, Stephen's not here. You're stuck with me. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Fred, so I, I usually do these Q&As. Steven does a lot of YouTube videos as well as myself, so you can check them out in other YouTube videos. With doing the live stream, you need extra software to have two on at a time. And Steven's like, Andrew, you love doing Q&A. You keep doing q and I said, well, you come on, Steven. You come on with me. He's like, no, no, that's your thing, man. Have fun with it. So um, I tend to do these Q&As, Fred, but you can catch Steven on other YouTube videos that we do. Um, Saeed, hi, Andrew. Is contacting large companies more difficult from small ones? Um, it depends. Every company is different. I, I think that with licensing, we, we give people rules, and then sometimes people take them as black and white when it's really shades of gray. So some big companies may be very hard to get into, and then others not, not at all. So it really varies quite a bit. You think that a smaller company would be easier to get into, and quite often they, they, they are, but what, what is small and what is big? So I always define, I define it a little bit different than Stephen. I mean, you got small, this is the way I like to do it in my head, okay? You got small, medium, and large size companies. Am I giving you specific definitions of those? No. But then you got mega corporations. So small, medium, large, and then you got mega corporations. So mega corporations are like, Google, Apple, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, 3M, those types of companies. There's very few. I could count them on two hands, the mega corporations. Are the mega corporations next to impossible to get into? Yes. But 
the companies that you guys can license to all day long are large companies that are for, let's say, consumer product. Just as an example, you might have other products in other areas. They're in, let's say it's a, a hardware type product, and they're in Home Depot and Lowe's and Walmart and Target. And you can license to those companies all day long. So you can license to really, really big companies. But when inventors come to me and they're like, well, it's just got to be Google or Apple. I'm like, okay, I can tell you have a ton of other companies here. You have like 15 other companies that aren't the Google or Apple, but they're a little bit more approachable. So don't let me saying that Google, Apple, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, 3M are really difficult to talk to hinder you at all because they're, there's only a few that are really that difficult. So um, are mega corporations, the way I define it, really difficult? Yeah, they're next to impossible. But large companies, you can reach out to them all day long, do deals with really big companies. Stephen was recently interviewing um, the, guy, the guy from, I forget what his name is, gentleman from Conair. That's a really big company, and they're in all the retailers, but you can get into them. So um, I, I wouldn't really even think about it. I would just do, think less and do more. I know, which is a weird thing to say to inventors, right? But just get in. You'll figure out which ones are difficult, which ones are hard. And people want to like watch our YouTube show and think on it, but you got to take action. And you'll find out if they're hard. And okay, some companies you got to reach out to them five, six, seven, eight times. And other ones, the first time they're like gatekeepers, like, oh no, you know, send it to Bob and he prefers emails. Here's his email address. And it was easy. And you reach out both on LinkedIn and via the phone. I don't think you should rely on just one or the other. I think you should do both. That's been our approach for a very long time. So I say thank you for the good question. Um, Javad says, we get this question all the time. Uh, what does what happens at one year after filing a PPA I've still, if I've still not made a, co a deal with the company? So a, a provisional patent application is called a PPA, provisional patent application. Attorneys are very anal about this. They're like, it's not a patent. It's an application, and they're absolutely right. Because if you don't later file a patent and reference the provisional, there is no protection. It's a placeholder in time that if you later file a provisional within that year, a patent, sorry, within that year and reference the provisional, then you get the date from the original provisional that whatsoever, whatever was in there. So, and just a little disclaimer for today. I was going to say tonight, but it's today. It's because we're doing this during the day this time. Um, anything that I share is not legal advice. Seek the services of an attorney if you seek legal advice and, and before you take any action at all. So um, a lot of – I've, I've heard of from a lot of inventors that patent attorneys misrepresent um, the provisional patent timeline in order to get an inventor to spend 10 grand on a patent. And they aren't lying, but they aren't telling the full truth either. So – you know, an inventor files a provisional, and most inventors that file a provisional, they'll file it because they get excited. Because it's exciting to find out that for 70 bucks, you can be able to say patent pending. Because when you have a provisional patent, you can say patent pending. You don't have to say provisional patent pending. But most inventors, after they file it, they do nothing or next to nothing. Because they don't know how to move forward and license their product. They don't know how to reach out to companies. They don't know how to make a sell sheet. They don't know how to make their list of companies. They don't know how to talk to companies. They don't know how to do any of this. So they file a provision, they just sit on their hands for a year. It happens all the time. It's not a big deal if you've done that. Don't worry about it. I'm not being critical of you. But then you go to an attorney 11 months, 10 months. Well, I filed a provisional, but it's running out, and, and I'm worried. I'm not going to be protected. And the attorney says, well, if you want to preserve your, your, your filing date, you need to file a full utility. And the inventor falls for it. And then they spend 10 grand on a patent. And then they file a full utility and they reference the provisional to get protection from that date. What the, what the patent attorney doesn't tell them is that if you haven't made a public disclosure, haven't sold it at a swap meet or put it up a public video or put it up on a website, which most inventors haven't, you haven't started the one-year on-bar rule from ticking. You haven't started that one-year time clock from ticking because one year from the time you make a public disclosure, you need to file a patent. But if you just privately show it for license, under the American Invents Act, that's not public disclosure, okay? And that doesn't start your one-year on bar rule from ticking. So, and especially if you even, even haven't shown it to anybody, you could file that same provisional again and get a year. Now, you lose your original date, like let's say it's 10 months ago. 
and you file the same provisional again today, you won't get protection from that date. You get protection from today. And if nobody's come up with it during those 10 months, you're, you're protected from today. And it's, I literally never talked to an inventor where they filed another provisional and go, oh, it screwed me up. It could in theory, but I've never talked to an inventor where that's ever happened to them. Not once. Now it could. Um, so to get another year of protection, not continuation, because they're not connected to each other, provisional patents are not connected to each other, you can get a year of protection when you haven't shown it to anybody or you just showed it privately for license, you can do that. And it doesn't cost you $10,000, it costs you another $70 for a provisional. Um, so now the, the attorney, when they tell you that, oh, if you want to preserve your, your filing date, you know, you need to file a full utility, you're going to lose all your rights. Well, they're not completely wrong in that you'll use your rights from that date, but you could file another provisional and get protection from that date. But provisionals don't protect you unless you later file a utility, but they give you the ability to fish off the pier and see if there's interest. Okay? So my general feeling about it, it's fine. File provisionals, get the warm and fuzzies, do nothing. It's not going to hurt you except to spend the time to write the provisional and spend the 70 bucks. But what's the point? If you don't intend on contacting companies, like my take on it is file a provisional like the week before you're ready to start reaching out to companies. Because a lot of the research that you do with figuring out your list of companies and looking at all the products in that space and doing all your research for your sell sheet, for your list of companies and all that, you're going to find things you weren't aware of. And you might be like, oh, I want to protect this too. And you throw it in your provisional. Now, it's not the end of the world if you file the provisional and you, oh, I want to protect this too. You could file a second provisional. And just take that existing provisional and has A and B in it and add C. And you could do that. A lot of people don't know that they can do that. So, Javed, I want to thank you for that question because my answer is going to, a lot of other people are thinking the same thing. Um, but don't let an attorney take advantage of you thinking that you're going to lose all your rights if you don't spend 10 grand on a patent. Now, yeah, you'll lose your date from the original provisional, but what are the chances that that will be a problem? Very low. Could they be? Yes. Have I ever met a single inventor ever in 20 years of doing event right where it was? No, that's my personal experience. So there's the, the paranoid or worse worrisome world that the new inventor lives in. And then there's the real world. And so I'm giving you a taste of what the real world is. And to think that you can do this business with and reduce your risk to zero, no risk. There's no business, any kind of business to reduce your risk to zero. There's always going to be risk. So you have to assume some of that risk and go $70,000, $10,000. Now, there might be cases where reserving that original provisional date is so, so important because it's in some brutal industry and you want to spend the 10 grand on a patent to get that date from the earlier provisional. It might make sense. Most of the time, I've found it doesn't. Um, but that's your personal decision. Uh, so let's see. Pankaj. Uh, hi, why is an LLC so important? So LLC is a limited liability company. Um, I don't think it's that important, but we talk about it and we talk about the importance of it that you want to file an LLC or corporation when you do a deal with a company under your LLC or corporation. Now, a lot of folks, you guys are in other countries. You're not going to file a U.S. LLC. You know, I mean, so if you're international, you know, just being international is your protection. So if a consumer wanted to sue you, they're not going to go to India and sue you in India. So, but if you're in the U.S. doing the deal not under your own personal name, but under a business name, is a, a form of protection. Now, in the 20 years, again, what's normal and what's not? In the 20 years of a doing event right, I've never had a single one of our students sued by a customer. Like we have students that are doing ladders or ladder attachments, really high liability stuff. If the consumer is going to sue somebody, they're going to sue the company, not you. They don't even know you exist. Companies don't put the, very few do, few do, very few, put the picture of the inventor on the product. So they don't know you exist. And they could look it up, but they're like, oh, this guy doesn't have deep pockets. We want to sue the company. You know, and if they do sue the company, you're covered under the company's product liability insurance. And we insist that our students, we say, no, you should insist that you're, it doesn't even cost them anything more to put you under their product liability insurance. But if for some reason that million, two, three million dollars in product liability insurance fails, 
you're under this LLC and they can't see you as an individual. They can sue your company and you don't leave any money in the company. So there's nothing to take. So it's just a way of reducing it. I don't think it's in the bigger spectrum of things. What I think it's the most important thing, Pankaj, um, absolutely not. But is that important? If you've got a lot of assets and you don't want to lose your money, yeah, I've never seen it happen in 20 years. Could it happen? Yes. So it makes sense to do it at that point when you're in the midst of a deal. I think I talked about this last week, though. I don't, I don't, I talk, I talk about it. Liability protection is not, is important. I'm not saying it's not important, but have I ever seen it be a problem? Have I ever had one of our students get sued by the consumer or the company? Not once. So in that sense, it's not as important as having a great sell sheet, re reaching out to companies, all that sort of thing. So just putting it in perspective. Uh, hi, Andrew. Suppose I want to add a feature to the product whose utility patent is still valid. Can I sell that under my name or do I give royalties to the original patent owner? It depends. So, you know, you can get a provisional patent or a patent and go around what they've patented. Oh, well, I'm going to do it a different way. So I'm not violating their patent or patenting on top of it. Um, in that case, no, you wouldn't have to pay a royalty. You have to look at the claims for their patent and go, oh, well, if I did it this way, it wouldn't be violating those claims in their patent. In that case, you don't have to pay them anything. Now, you can patent on top of what they did. So let's say whatever your invention is, is an improvement to what they did, but without what they did, you can't do what you want to do. So they have these features A and B, and you got C, but it's not going to work without A and B that they've patented. That's, called, that's what Steve and I refer to as patenting on top of their technology. And most of the time, it doesn't make sense to do that because then you need their permission, this one company's permission. But sometimes it might make sense. Um, and in that case, yeah, you would have to pay them and, and they have to, or maybe you can only license it to them. So does that make sense to come up with a product where you can only license it to that one company? Always think about it. How can I go around it? How can I do it different? So I don't have to do it just on top of patenting on top of it. So you're allowed to patent on top of what they did, but if you can't utilize your invention without their patent, well, then you're kind of screwed because then you're completely dependent on them, which is not a very ideal scenario. And if you're like, oh, but, but it's so perfect for them. Okay, spend 70 bucks, see if they're interested. But now you're not reaching out to 30 companies. You're reaching out to one company. That can be kind of aggravating. You do all this work and then one company's not interested. But it might be. It might make sense. Most of the time it doesn't. Um, now, Sandy, you expanded on that. And then you're kind of talking about how you're modifying it for a different purpose. And in that case, you might be able to completely get around what they did because it's for a whole different purpose, different functionality, okay? And uh, none of these can be specifically answered without actually looking at the real product and the real patent, which we're not going to do on a QA, and a of course, because um, it would take up the entire hour. Um, <laughs> that's funny. It's a funny joke. By the way, type your name if you just – if your handle is not your name, I always like to address people by their name. Um, Raul, hi Andrew, when submitting design variants of the same product to a novelty company, should I send all of them in one email or one for each design I've created uh, cell sheets for each? Um, you know, with, with a, a non-novelty company, I would not recommend, you have to decide what your best version is. But if it's a novelty, you know, they're going to take a quick glance at it. <clears throat> I think it's okay to send multiple variants. Um, and you can put them all in the same cell sheet. Novelty companies, they kind of look at it. And because it's a novelty, it's like, what is this? What's the right vibe? Oh, I don't know. oh yeah, I like that one. You know, and that would be okay. But if it's outside of a novelty product, you can't submit them like three variations. Oh, it could be like this or this or this all in the sell sheet. You want it to be the marketing that they would use. You have to decide on one. But Raul, I would make an exception for novelties and I would say it's okay to send some variants because 
usually not highly technical things that are hard to figure out. You're just going to look at it and kind of get it. So I think it would be okay to do that in novelty. But most of the time I would say, no, you definitely don't want to do that. You're, they're going to get a little upset. Well, I'm sitting these, I'm like, what is this one? You know, they figure out the minute differences of each one. It, that doesn't make sense in most categories. You have to decide on one version of scent. Um, and if they don't like that one and you say, well, I've got some other versions. Can you take a quick look? Then you could send those if you ask permission. Um, Sandy says, this new time is good. USA, UK, and Asia are both convenient. Okay, cool. Um, I don't know. If we're, I, I wanted to see how many people show up. I'd say we have a little less than we normally have, quite a few less. We've been hitting sometimes like 100 live and we're at like 51 live, 52. So, so far, my assessment is stick with the 510 or maybe try another time. We could kind of mix it up. Nobody's ever going to be happy. Not everybody's going to be happy with any time we do. Everybody's going to be like, I like this time. I want this one. So um, we'll figure it out, though. Again, the only reason why I'm doing it this time because I was on a camping trip, so um, which I never take any vacation at all. So it was very refreshing. Um, Let's see what we got here. Susie, I have a product that I think would align with some Disney movie lines. Can I create a sell sheet using Disney characters to show how the product works? Yes, you can absolutely do that, Susie. It's called fair use. Can't put it up on a website. You know, I had this one student, and, and this is back when I used to coach, and because um, I was our original coach. Now we have 10 coaches and a negotiation coach. Um, but back when I was a coach and, and I didn't know that he had a website, he didn't tell me. And it was something to do with the NFL. I forget what the product was exactly, but he, he put, and he had a website, had NFL logos all over it. And they called it, they, they sent him a cease and desist letter and he was like freaking out. I'm like, take it down like yesterday and say, you're sorry. And he did, and they didn't pursue him, but you can't do that. You can't publicly use Disney characters or NFL or NHL or NBA or any of this, but privately you can, it's called fair use. So when you privately show it to an individual company via email and you, you put down at the bottom, all trademarks and logos are the right of their respective owners. These are for illustrative purposes only. And you know, we do not have the, the rights to these trademarks. Blah, blah, blah. You can do that. It's called fair use. You can look it up on Wikipedia. And, and it can be very powerful. But here's the downside. If, if you want to show like companies that don't do any brand licensing, when a co most of the Disney stuff is not done by Disney. It's done by other companies. So they pay Disney a royalty to put Mickey Mouse or Cars or my eight-year-old daughter, she just turned eight, um, is in the Descendants. That's like the latest uh, show for girls, like a musical slash thing. Anyway, so if you want to put descendants on there, you know, and, and companies are making T-shirts or toys or whatever, they go to Disney and they go, hey, we want to make T-shirts with Uma, which is one of the characters. And they're like, okay, we'll, we'll look at your distribution and give you the rights. And then they pay Disney a royalty, not for the invention, but for the right to put those characters that people know so well on their product, whether it's a T-shirt or a doll or whatever it is. Um, but when you do that, you're limiting yourself. So you show it to companies that aren't doing any brand licensing, aren't paying Disney for stuff. And they're like, well, do you have those, do you have those contracts? And like, you're like, no, I thought you could do that. And so you're asking them to do what they don't do. You don't ask a company that makes toys and doesn't do any brand licensing, which is paying Disney to write to put their product on their products and sell them to do that. So but what you can do Sometimes you make a sell sheet, you'll show some of the Disney possibilities, for example, but then you'll show a generic. So you see generic and branded versions available. So that way, when you're reaching out to 30 companies, you're appealing to the ones that have uh, do brand licensing and put Disney characters in this example on their products, but also in a generic way. So they're not going to go, well, we don't do that. They're going to, oh, I see the generic version. Oh, you're just going to put um, race cars on it. Okay. So, um, so sometimes you can create marketing materials that address both. So be very aware of that, Susie. So and be aware that, you know, there's a ton of Disney licensees that you can sell and license your product to that isn't Disney. 
Okay, and they're, if they're all those companies that have Disney products. They've paid Disney. Now, they're going to need to pay you a royalty and Disney, so you should be willing to take a lower royalty, but they're going to sell so much more product because they're famous characters. So I realize they're going to be paying a double royalty, one to you, the inventor, and also to Disney, and that's fine. That's fantastic. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Sandy says, please keep this time only, please. I can't, I can't promise that, Sandy. Um, although you can watch the replays. You, know, you can't ask questions on the replay, but you can watch the replays. Uh, Jake says, should I submit to the company with the best fit or to multiple companies at once? Always multiple companies at once because it takes them forever to get back to you. You don't want to string this out over a year. You'd rather be done in three or four months, right? Like there's a few stragglers that still need and then it takes like three or four months. I'm just throwing out a random figure here. It depends on how hard you push. But if you get interest, oh, they're interested. Oh, keep talking. Oh, these are my guys. I'm so, you know, and the two and a half months go by. Ah, oh, we're not interested. We decided no. And then you're approaching another couple of companies. Another one shows interest. And then you're back, forth, back, forth, two months. Oh, we said we're not interested. You string this thing out forever, blow it out to everybody from the get-go. Okay, and you don't tell them you're doing that. If they ask, oh, yeah, sure, of course, I'm shopping around. You don't throw that back in their face. That is not cool, very unprofessional. So don't, don't pit them against each other ever. Um, not never, 99% of the time. Uh, Roman, uh, hello, Andrew. Yes, my hello there, huh? Can companies you pitch to steal your idea and patent your idea in Europe or other continents while you're still in PPA stage. So the provisional patent application, um, the U.S. is what's called, this gets boring, guys, is part of what's called the PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty, and Europe is part of the PCT as well as the U.S., so you could later file a U.S. Um, patent. So I'll give you what's normal. With our students, when they're conducting themselves professionally, a lot of inventors don't, but our students do. I've never had one of our companies ever um, – any company that our student presented to knock their idea off. Um, I've never seen that happen. So it could happen, but I haven't seen it happen. So, um, you know, and so, you know, anybody that files in Europe, anything that's done in the U.S. is going to be prior art. So, um, you know, that's going to be prior art, and that might affect their patentability there as well. It, it just move forward with your ideas. This is what I always say is, it is 100 times more likely that an inventor rips themselves off out of their own fears of getting ripped off by never showing it to companies than they actually get ripped off by a company. Like literally 100, maybe 1,000 times more common. Um, so could that happen, Roman? Yes, it could. Have I ever seen it happen with our students? No. Now our students are conducting themselves professionally. But I really wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about that. But in a roundabout way, filing a U.S. provisional is – is a placeholder is a provisional patent in Europe too, because you could lay that company or you could later file a PCT and then file in Europe as well. And I know some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but it gets too damn boring to get into detail with the patent stuff. Um, let's see. Too many patent questions, guys are boring. I, I'll answer them though. Don't worry. Um, uh, oh, Mr. Sugar, what price range can I expect to pay a patent attorney to help me file a PPA? Well, if you use our software, our software is 99 bucks and the patent office fee is 70. Um, if you get a patent attorney to write it, I would say anywhere from 500 to $8,000. And so I'll qualify why I say 8,000. So I would say to have a patent attorney file, write the provisional for you, I would say 500 to 3,000 would be normal. Um, now, the reason why I say sometimes eight, some patent attorneys, what they want to do is just get all your money up front because they know a lot of inventors will file stuff and never do anything with it. So they'll say, oh, I'll want to write it like a full utility. I'll charge you eight, and then I'll only charge you 1000 or 2000 when you upgrade to the full utility. So that's the reason why the ridiculous figure. But I would say if it's just a provisional, not written like a full utility patent, I would say 500 to 3000 would be common. I've seen more. Um, if you file it yourself using our software, it's the $99 for the software and then the 70 bucks to file it. And that's called Smart IP. That's on our website. We give that to our students when they join our boot camp. 
for our academy and it's included, but you can do a one-time use on our website. Um, so yeah, that's about the range. Um, and there are some places where, you know, it's not really an attorney doing it for you. I won't mention websites, but they're you're just filling out like a template form system. And I don't find they're as good as our smart IP solution. And they will charge you $400 or whatever, but you're not getting an attorney to do it. And I don't find that to be worth it. I think our, I'm biased, but I think our smart IP solution we do with Pat Attorney Gene Quinn is great at 99 bucks. I think it's a great deal. Um, uh, uh, Lem says, does the PPA need to be filed in the LLC as well? No, but it can be. So it's, that's up to you. Um, Mike says, how much FaceTime will you need with the, with your lawyer? Can he or she be in a different city? Absolutely. I don't think it's necessary at all for your patent attorney to be in the same city as you. Uh, and I think you can get a much more affordable patent attorneys in the Midwest, places like that. Um, God, so many PPA questions. My God, guys. Okay, Java says, how can I make sure, I think this is a good question, a PPA does have value and can prevent companies from going around me. My best advice is not about legal speak, guys. Creating a strong, strong provisional patent is about, you, you've decided, okay, let's say that your pen is this, in, this is your invention. And a lot of inventors are, you're creative, right? But once you've been thinking about it a while, you're like, this is it. This is the invention. This is the only, this is it. Just like this. That'll mess you up every time. If you say, well, this is like this, and this is the product I'm going to license, but it could be like this, or it could be like that. And what's another version? It's just as good, but not the version I'm pitching, or 90% or 70% is good. You got to cover those variations. So you knock yourself off and you throw those other variations into your provisional patent. But most inventors, the longer they think about it, they're so fixed in their mind, this is the way it is, that they are lost their inventiveness. And so you need to put your feet up on the desk and knock yourself off and go, well, it could be like this and be like that. It's not what I'm going to pitch it because I still think this is the best from a marketing standpoint, but I'm going to cover the variations. That is the most important thing that you're, you, you can do when you file a provisional patent application. And most not, or file a patent. The problem is most inventors, they don't do that. And then the attorney, which shame on them, doesn't force you to do that. They give me the variations. They take whatever garbage the inventor gives them, which they didn't think through, they didn't think about the variations, and then the patent attorney just files it. So inventors and patent attorneys do this all day long, and that's why most patents are garbage. Because both the inventor didn't do it, shame on the inventor for not thinking about the variations, but shame on the attorney for not telling the screen inventor, look, if you want me to do a good job, I need all the variations. And so they take your 10,000, they file it. And I think some attorneys are jaded. And they're like, well, he's never going to go anywhere. He's not going to do anything with it. It doesn't matter. And it will never get evaluated. Who cares? Now, do I think most patent attorneys feel that way? No. But some of them, they just don't care. They, they, and they do not care about you if they did not force you to think about the variations. That's my biased viewpoint. And that's why some intellectual property experts believe that up to, this is, I think that's a little extreme, up to 80% of patents are weak to garbage. So you get a patent, you think it's strong, but if you just have a bunch of weak claims in there, it's not. You know? So, boy, I really went off on that one, didn't I? Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh Don says, our invent right fees do up front. Yeah, we, we coach and mentor people for half a year. So, yeah, you, we let people pay over six months, Don. Um, so we, we trust because we do such a great job. I mean, a lot of people selling programs like, oh, need all the money up front because they're not going to do a good job of coaching. We let people pay over six months, but it's not a uh, – you're expected to complete the six months. If you didn't, you'd be like defaulting on the payment, you know, if you will. Um, so, but it's not like, oh, well, after you license, you know, uh, then you can pay us because you're going to have learned how to license. We'll have spent six months helping you regardless of whether or not you license your first product. So, you know, and so, yeah, you have to, you don't have to pay it all up front. Um, you can pay it over six months, but 
we, we coach and mentee for half a year. It's a lot of friggin' work. So we, we don't do that for free or on the come, as they say. Uh, V2 vids. I don't know their name. Is fitness a developer friendly industry? Yeah, fitness is great. Everybody wants the, <laughs> some people, they want the easy fix. Um, you know, it's this device and for doing sit-ups and yeah, it'll give you ripped abs, but if you're 200 pounds overweight, you won't see your muscles, you know? <laughs> so they always want new ab devices. And I am just saying that as a joke, of course, there's a lot of opportunity in fitness, a lot of opportunity in physical therapy. I've had a lot of students there and physical fitness for little gadgets and gizmos all the way up to full on exercise devices um, and recovery products for people that are, um, in some sort of physical recovery, things like that. So, yeah, it's a great industry. Um, we have people inventing there all the time. You're welcome, Saeed. Saeed said, thank you. Oh, I love this one. Saeed said, this is great for everybody. Great question, Saeed. I have many ideas. Uh, if I have many ideas, then how should I choose the right one to start with? So let's let's talk about that for a little bit. If you're willing to work on a litany of ideas that you have, um, you can, I can give you some criteria to whittle that down. So let's do ease of manufacturing first. One is, manufacture. if you write this down, guys, this will be useful. Write the word manufacturing, dash, easy or hard. Manufacturing, easy or hard, okay? So some products, you can just look at similar products, other products on the market, and you can go, oh, well, I just made a slight change. Well, let's say these glasses here. I'm just making a slight change to this part here so it's more comfortable, okay, or I'm putting a little rubber on here, or whatever it is. I'm, I'm not saying that's a good invention, guys. So if you can make – and that's an example of it being easy. You come up with these unique little, um, just randomly, I'm coming up with this, guys. But it's this rubbery material that you cut and stick on here. And it has these really bumps. It just feels cushy and fun. Like, sometimes I put glasses on and it's like hurting the bone on the back of my ear. And let's say, and let's say you sell it and then you tell people they can cut it and fit it on there. That's an example of manufacturing easy, especially... If you're seeing that they have this material in another area and you're like, well, let's move it over here. We'll sell in a little sheet and people can cut it to their glasses and put it on. Pretty easy because you can look at similar things and go, I know they can do it. Like maybe I'm having a hard time doing it, but I know they can do it. So I'll sell the benefits. Whereas, you know, it, again, another, it's a ridiculous example. But if you're like, oh, I think it'd be a great idea to build a robot that can jump up on your roof and shingle the house so you don't need to, workers don't need to sweat in the 100 degree heat and if they fall off they're not going to die and the robot will fall off or whatever and so it's good for safety and and man and labor and whatever and the company's like well how do we do that and you're like i, I don't know but i think it's a good idea you know you, you, that's an extreme ridiculous example but so if you have some products that are easier to manufacture now maybe the product is hard to manufacture but your change to it is not so don't get all of, uh, you know worried about like, well, I don't understand the inner workings of that product and every little aspect. And you're like, and I would be like, well, maybe you don't need to. Maybe you just need to understand your change. And that change is simple. So sometimes people think they need to fully understand the technology and manufacture and all that. But you just need to understand um, if the change can be made. So that's the first one, manufacturing easy or hard. And if you look at like, um, who are we talking to here? Got it. Uh, jumped up here. Who asked the question? I'm trying to. Okay. Saeed. Um, Saeed, so if you have five ideas, you know, you're probably going to go, okay, project one, ooh, brutal. I just don't know how they're going to do it. Project two, oh, yeah, I think it would be pretty simple because of this, because of that. And you, you can kind of gauge them on all five of your projects. Now, that's not the only criteria. So manufacturing, easy or hard. Then you have ease of understanding. So some products and their benefits, just, you know, I'll make a sell sheet, it's just easy. Like, oh, they're going to see this picture with the right words and you're just going to get it. And other products, it's like, uh, you got to go through a lot of explanation. 
you know, maybe you have to have this long drawn out video, but when people are looking at the store shelf and they just see a picture, if they don't get it really quick, they'll give you a few seconds, that's it. So some products are really hard to understand and some products are easier. So first criteria is manufacturing easy or hard. Second criteria is ease of understanding. So, you know, easy or hard. Is it easy or hard to understand? So ease of understanding. So do people get the product? Um, then, you know, of course, the really important thing, the really important thing is, is studying the marketplace. So how does your product fit in amongst all these other products? You know, is your product a me too product? Oh, the God, there's like eight products in this space, but I have this slight little change and I know that these products are selling well because there's like eight or 10 of them, different companies. People misperceive that. They think like, I got to come up with something so new, nothing like it. If it's somewhat, if it's like a variation of something that you can see selling well, well, Andrew, how do I know something's selling well? Well, if there's eight of them in eight different companies, you know it's selling well. It wouldn't be there if it wasn't selling. And and they're not being creative. They're all kind of doing more or less the same thing. And you've got this slight tweak. Well, if your product sits on amongst the shelf with, let's say, three of them, because not every store is going to have all eight, but there's like three, and your product's there, it's like, oh, oh, I like this one because it has that extra thing, right? So sometimes it has that little extra something. So, But how does it fit in the marketplace? Is it a slight improvement in a category where things are selling really well? Or is it something really different? It can't be really different. But does it fit in? Is there a, a need being missed? Like there's these over here and over here and over here. Oh, I'm, I'm right in the middle here and I'm addressing it. So you want to study the marketplace. This is the most important thing out of all three of these things that I've said and see how it fits in and be honest with yourself. So you need to become an expert in the micro category of your invention. So if you've got, uh, you know, let's say, let's say, what, what is this? I don't even know why this is on my desk. My daughter left it on here. So this is, oops, let me get down here. Okay. So this is a business card holder. It's just some cheap dollar store business card holder, right? So you need to know every business card holder that's out there. And you can study the marketplace and you can become an expert at business card holders in about four hours. And how does yours fit in? But you need to be honest with yourself. But all those other business card holders, what are the benefits? Not, oh, that one sucks. That one sucks. Mine better than that. Mine better. Not that. Don't do that. Oh, that one. Okay. It's cheap. Okay. That one, it's super fancy. Okay. That one, it's super slim. You look at the marketing. You look at the materials. You look at the price ranges. You need to understand that and go, how does mine fit in amongst those? What's, how is mine different? You need to be honest with yourself. So if you look at your five products, Saeed, I'm, I don't. I don't know if you have five products, but let's say you have five. Some of them are going to have more punch than others. And some of them might not have a lot of punch, but it's a slight variation on thing, uh, something that you see that's selling really well because there's a whole bunch of companies selling it. So that is the most important thing you could do. How does it fit in the marketplace? Manufacturing, easy or hard. Ease of understanding, easy or hard. There's other criteria too, but if you guys use those three, that's great. Now I'm going to sit here annoying you guys by closing and opening that. I don't even know why that's on my desk. I have no idea. This is my daughter, by the way. That's my that's my daughter. She just turned eight. I don't know how old she's there, maybe six or something, but it's on my desk. Anyway, um, I had a lot of fun with her on my camping trip. We played in the river. It was amazing. Um, so thank you, Saeed. I think that not only did I answer your question, but I think a lot of other people are thinking the same thing. And that is uh, great information. I think will help a lot of you. Um, when I do these Q&As, sometimes people want to ask such specific questions for them that it won't benefit anybody else. And I always try to broaden it out, um, it, you know, and it, so, but I, I always do my best to answer your specific question as well. Um, okay. How, uh, how, uh, how is the name? And he also says, how, how to license your product while being part of product development with the licensee. Okay. Are companies willing to do so? Thank you, Andrew, with an exclamation mark. Thank you for the exclamation mark. I like your excitement. Uh, 
Absolutely. Uh, a lot of a lot of companies will work with you to develop it further. Like they might, well, we really we really like this business card case. It's really it's really fun, but you know, and they'll present you with problems. Don't freak out. Oh, but you know, with the way that you glued this here, we're concerned about manufacturing. And you're like, you know, let, let me think on that. What are you concerned about? Well, it's, we don't think it's going to work because of this. We think it might break or it'd be too costly or whatever it is. And then you come back with solutions. So working with a company and being open to and establish a relationship where they can tell you what they like and don't like about it and you can address some of the things that they don't like is a big part of inventing. And yes, a lot of companies are open to that. Absolutely. Some inventors, they don't ask for it because they don't want to hear it. And that's bad because then the company goes out, they make their own conclusions. They don't share with you what the problems are and then you don't have an opportunity to fix it. So you just want to let them know that you're open to that. Look, if there's problems, you know, with the manufacturing or anything else, you know, hit me up. I might be able to come up with some solutions. So you can actually, you can absolutely work with them. Um, so how to do it, how you just do it. You know, you don't worry about it and you work with them. Some companies are, want a lot of it. Some are like, no, no, we, we kind of got it from here. We'll check back with you. Okay, what are you looking, what are you looking to do? We're going to do this and then you're going to check back with me then. And so you always want to get clarification. It's really important to do that. Um, it's so weird doing these live chats. I don't, so I'm supposed to be looking at the camera or it's weird if I'm just staring at you guys. Um, if you guys actually, if you guys can give me some feedback on what you prefer. No, Andrew, I like it when you look away or I want you looking at the camera the whole time. I think most of these Q&As that I've been doing for quite some time right now, I'm not looking at the camera. So if you guys could give me some thoughts on that before we, because we're going to close it out here in about 13 minutes, um, let me know. Uh, so I have some feedback there. Just try at the camera or away from the camera, what you guys prefer, or type, I don't care. <laughs> um, most of you probably don't care. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Yeah, we addressed this. Maybe, you know, I do so much free education. I don't remember where we addressed this, but I've addressed it many times on the Q&A. Debbie's saying, what if two companies want to license your product? Do you license it to both? You move forward with them both as if the other one doesn't exist, Debbie, and most likely one will drop off. Um, and it's unusual to be at the final contract stages with multiple, and it's a good problem to have. The only time when it really becomes an issue is if they start spending money. So if they're going to spend five grand on making a prototype or doing something, you know, but usually they're not going to be doing a lot of that until you've signed. But if they start doing that, then it become problematic. But again, that's a good problem to have. If they start spending money, then they're starting to commit. And I love that. So move forward with the other one, each of them, as if the other one doesn't exist. That's what I want you to do. And it freaks people out. Um, but that's what we do. We always guide our students to do. And you don't pit them against each other. You don't even mention the other one. They ask directly, say, yeah, of course, I'm shopping it around. Um, and you don't kiss and tell. You don't tell them details. I got to stop clicking this thing. It's going to drive you guys nuts. But um, uh, yeah, so good question. Um, let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh. Maxwell, how long does it take for most companies to respond to the idea you submitted? It varies tremendously. Some of them never respond, and that's why you need to reach out multiple times and remind them. Um, okay, that's, so he's asking more specifically after they've said, yes, send it. So it's very common, and people trip out on this, but you, know, you talk to them on the phone, or uh, the gatekeeper said, oh, just drop them an email. Well, let's say you talk to them on the phone. And they said, yeah, send it on over. Or you talk to them on LinkedIn and yeah, send it on over. And then they don't respond. And people freak out. They're just busy. They're usually, they're usually marketing managers. They're doing a lot of different stuff. So you need to send it again. And never, ever say, send an email and say, did you get it? Did you get it? Never, ever, 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 ever do that. Always send it again. So you kind of forward the email that you already sent so they can see, oh, he sent it to me before. You just say, hey, you know, please take a look at the attached sell sheet and let me know if this is something that you might be interested in licensing. 
um, I'm a product developer and I'm looking to license this to you. They can see they sent it again. They're just busy. So, so it can take weeks of back and forth on that sort of thing after they said, yes, and yes, well, you can send it. And it's normal. And you're not going to give up until you get a no, but you're going to be very polite. You're going to be a polite pest. You don't want to email them every day. I would say once a week after they've sent, they said, yes, they'll take a look at it at most. And you're going to keep yourself busy by approaching other companies. But what happens is you fall, you're you like, oh, this, these are my favorite. This is my favorite. And you're sitting around being anxious. And you just got to be patient. One of the things that's very important with licensing is patience. But you can keep yourself busy by approaching other companies and doing other things. And then it won't feel like you're sitting there biting your fingernails waiting. That will drive you nuts. And they'll respect you for it. They'll respect for your, your persistence, but they'll respect that you're not being a wacky inventor, emailing every day, being upset they didn't get back to you right away. They got a lot of other st stuff going on. You are not their top priority at all. Okay? So you need to know that. Now, they need all, a minute to think on it too. You know, like they're, they're busy, they're overwhelmed like a lot of us, and they need a minute to think on it. Maybe they looked at it, and they wanted to come back to it uh, at the end of the week. Oh, well, you know, I'll get back to that on Friday. And they never got around to it. And they literally forgot about it. Doesn't mean they didn't like it, but they got other more pressing things. And then you send it again and they give it some thought. Oh, yeah, you know, let's talk. You know, and now they got a, a little bit of time. Okay, yeah, you know, I have some time on Tuesday. They're people. They're not companies. They're people within the companies. And people are flawed and we're not 100% functioning human beings where we're perfect and we're following up on everything all the time and they're going to make making their boss happy now if their boss happens to say we need new products two weeks earlier now you're more at the top of their priority list and sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll be right in that zone it's just timing and you can never time it you're either right there at the right time or you're not and you just keep approaching so it varies tremendously and you're just not going to be done until you get a no from every company on your list and Inventors aren't, we teach, that is, that is one of the biggest things we teach our students and push our students. I'll use the word push to do. We don't accept um, that they've got no's from 15 out of 30. They are not done until they get no's from 30 out of 30. Now, is there a breaking point where you've tried LinkedIn, you've tried the phone, you've tried all these different techniques eight different times, 10 different times you try to get in and you just, they're just not responsive in any way, shape, or form in any way you approach them and you go, okay, that one's done. Is there a time where you do that? Yes. But it's a lot later than you, most of you would give up a lot sooner. Um, and so it's a variety of like, oh, I got in first time and oh, I need to try two or three times or I need to try 10 times. It's all over the map. And it's really weird. Sometimes I'll have a student same industry, almost the same companies, and they're like, oh, it's brutal. I can't get in. Another student's like, I got into like 10 in a day. And I'm like, okay. Um, it's, it's, it's an attitude and it's a persistence, and it's what you send and how you say it too. I'm sure if I took a look at those two different students that they were doing things slightly different. Um, uh, let's see. We have seven minutes left. So, Debbie, great question. Having multiple companies interested is normal, and you should never be concerned about it, and you should just push forward. Um, and don't sit around waiting for one to say no to approach another. You'll want to shoot yourself in the head. Nobody has that much patience. <laughs> we don't teach people to have that much patience, nor is it smart to do that. It'll take too friggin' long. Uh, Maxwell, great question. How long does it take for companies to respond? Thank you for that question. Um, Uh, so, oh, oh, white, um, looking at Fiverr to find someone to draw quality diagrams, the ones interested in helping are international people, not sure if an NDA can be enforced. What do you recommend? You know, a lot of our students used to use Fiverr and they got so frustrated. We created our own design department. So when students sign up with us through our boot camp program, we do the design work for them just to get them up and running. Um, yeah, if, if a uh, if, uh, overseas contractor doesn't want to sign an NDA, don't do it. You got to be very careful with Fiverr. Actually, the default it used to be, I don't know if it's still the case, um, when you sign up with them, you are giving them permission to publicly post the work they do for you, which you definitely 100% do not want. 
Um, so make sure to read the contract that that's agreed that you won't do that. I think there might be a checkbox where it says that you're not okay with that. I haven't checked in. Um, a lot of people get really upset with the communication issues with people on Fiverr because they're overseas. English isn't their first language. Um, so we had so many people complaining about that. We created our own design department, which is not easy. Trust me. I think we got it tweaked in now, but it took us a long time. Um, uh, huh. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what your name is. Sim similar is your name. Similar frequencies. I just clicked on a smart IP link provided by Google search. It resulted in a 404 error. Go to event right and then go to services. Similar frequencies. It's so weird addressing people by their handle. And uh, see if that leads to a 404 error. I don't think it should. Maybe that was an old link you found, but you shouldn't have found that. So I'll, I'll Google it myself. But go to the services page on our site and uh, click on Smart IP. And you should be able to find it. Um, but thank you. I'll, I'll research that and make sure that there's not a broken link. Uh, Ron says, what do I do after I get my patent number and want to license an idea? Well, you did it all in the wrong order, Ron. No worries. A lot of people do. Huge numbers of people do. Um, first off, if you're using the event right approach, and this is not a slam on anybody that's filed a patent, but you don't need to do that. File a provisional the week before you're ready to start calling. Got a whole year to fish off the pier. Why would you spend 10 grand on a patent? Doesn't make any sense. Now we have tons of new students that come on board having done that, but in the future, you don't have to do that. So that's my first comment. You don't have to file a full patent. You file a provisional. It gives you a year to see if there's interest. Now, if you don't know how to license, it doesn't do you any good. Um, so utilize that year that it gives you, and if there's interest, get them to pay for the patent. They give you the money, you give it to your patent attorney, and you, you file the patent, and you're giving them the rights, exclusive rights to manufacture the product. Now. If, and I'm using you as an example, Rob. I'm not saying you did this. Another mistake people can make, which is even worse, is to think that you need to file a full utility patent and wait for it to issue before you can call companies. I actually like it better if it's not issued. They don't know what claims are, you're going to get or not going to get. It's stronger to me in some senses that they don't know what claims you're going to get or not get, and patent pending with a full utility is better than issued. So you, would you, it takes like two to three years for your patent issue. So to file a patent, wait two to three years for it to issue, and then maybe does, the product doesn't make sense anymore is absolute craziness. And, and so, Ron, don't do that. So you wrote, what do I do after I get my patent number and I want to license my idea? The answer is don't wait to get your patent number, ever. If you haven't filed a full patent, just file a provisional. If you filed a patent, go ahead and start calling if it's pending. Don't sit around waiting for a patent issue because there's a very good chance the product doesn't even make sense anymore by the time it issues. Um, so thank you for le letting me use you as an example, Ron. And I'm not saying you did or didn't do those things. Maybe you haven't filed anything. Um, all right, we got about two minutes left. Let's see. Um, Christopher, hi, Andrew. Brilliant explanations for the coaching process. Great. Yeah, if, if you guys have any questions about the coaching process and how it works, I'd be happy to answer them. I mean, basically, every single week, the coach is on top of you, talking to you on the phone or on Skype with video if you want to look them in the eyes, which I like. Um, and they're saying, oh, for your project, do this, do that. And they're giving you our 10-step system, but they're putting the context of your product, which is huge. Um, and that's what most inventors need. People watch YouTube videos, they read books. Uh, but does that apply here? So to give the specifics of how it applies to your product or the specifics of, oh, a company said this, this is what I need to say next, that's why our students are licensing products when others aren't. And that's, you know, what most people need to be successful. It's, it's hard to take general advice. Although it gives people, you're in a world of, a different world than most inventors. Just by watching our YouTube show and doing these live streams, you're going to be doing way better than the average inventor, but they're still like, oh, but does that apply to me? Oh, but what if this? What if that? What if, what if? And you kind of what if yourself to death into inaction, or sometimes it's not inaction. I think sometimes people are watching a YouTube show. We give people enough confidence in doing things, but it's, it's like 10% of the volume and the intensity that it needs to be. 
So instead of reaching out to 30 companies with the right sell sheets, the right list of companies, they're reaching out to three companies with the wrong sell sheet, and maybe only two of those three companies are even appropriate sort of thing. So I do think we do a lot to, with our free education to get people going a little more, but it's never with the intensity that is required to be successful. Um, it, you need to be really intense about it. When I say it, it's not really intense. It's like reaching out to 30 companies instead of three. It's just more work. It's not, I don't even know if intense is the right mindset. Um, it's more, because if you weren't intense, but you were consistent and every week, you just kept reaching out, reaching out. That's not intense. That's consistent. So you're consistently persistent. Um, that's a really important um, that's a really important trait to have that's a critical trait to have when you're licensing um, let's see uh, David says he's appreciating that I'm doing my best to answer questions but also broadening out so everybody everybody benefits. Yeah, but I was answering super specific questions for all of you, and you're like, this doesn't remotely apply to me. People wouldn't want to show up for these Q&As. So thank you. are right, David. I want to make make sure everybody benefits from it. Um, uh, yeah, so similar frequencies. There's her handle mentions. Uh, this is my first time joining live. Would it be okay to send a sell sheet but not a physical product? Absolutely. Um, what you're selling, for those of you that are new, which you're new, um, you're selling the benefit of your product, not your prototype or your patent. So to send a virtual prototype, like something that's rendered or drawn, and it looks, and then you got the right mark, and you show them how they're going to market it, and you don't have a physical prototype at all, our students do it all the time. And that's why I include a virtual prototype with, uh, and a sell sheet with uh, our boot camp program. We include that. And huge numbers of our students do not have physical prototypes, and that's fine. Now, some of them do, and it's like, looks great. Okay, let's take a picture of that. But what you're selling is the benefit of your product, not your physical prototype. So absolutely. And just things like that get people over this hump. You, you've, you, some of you have such an ingrained feeling like, well, I have to have this beautiful prototype, and I have to have a patent, so I have to spend that ten grand on the patent attorney, and I got to spend $5,000 on a prototype. I just, of course. And then they hear me saying the contrary and we just saved them a ton of money and heartache. Um, so I, I'm really proud of what Stephen and I and all our coaches do and what we do with our free education to get people into an empowering mindset where you don't have to mortgage your house and home. Um, now, sometimes highly technical products, certain whatever reason for this or that, do you need to make a prototype? Yeah, so it's not black and white. But it's amazing how much you can get away with and see what the interest level is. So um, I think that we're – so you guys didn't help me out, I don't think. So that before we wrap up, I want you guys to type into the chat. So, so I want you to tell me, look at the camera, don't look at the camera, or I don't care. If you guys could type it in because I answered a lot of your questions. That's what I want to know. Is it nice for me to look at the camera? You want me to kind of not look because it's weird when I'm staring you in the eyes um, or I don't care. And go ahead and type that in. I only got one so far. If you already typed it in, type it in again. I want to get at least 20 people typing something in. Um, so Invent Factor said at the camera. Linda said look at the camera. Yes. One said a bit of both. One said I don't care. Um, and the ex expounded explanations are really helpful. Yeah, I've been told I'm good at that. I'm not good at a lot of things, but I'm good at that. Thank you, Thomas. Um, okay, we get about 10 in here. I'm going to take a screen capture of that, too, because it's hard to look at the chat after the fact. Uh, so let me do that. Uh, so if you guys, maybe uh, five more people could type in, so I have a good... Yeah. <laughs> One person said, I don't care as long as your your answer satisfied me completely. Um, so, yeah, I could see that. No need to stare at the camera. All right. So let me take a screen capture of this. I was just curious. It's really not that important. There we go. Okay, cool. Uh, I think –
so my conclusion with what you guys are typing in, I think I'm going to do a little bit of both. I, I just, I want to do a great job. I, I, I look like a geek with this headset, but I get better audio and you guys don't care what I look like. So if I can get you better audio with the headset, that's why I have the headset. If I'm looking a little at the camera, a little away, that's, that's what I'll do. Um, okay. So um, next week we're going to do it. I'm going to be back. I'm going to do it again at 510 Pacific time. I, I will analyze whether or not uh, time during the day might make sense. Um, you know, a lot of, I'm going to analyze. I actually, I'm not going to promise you're going to do it 510 next week. I might do vary it maybe at four Pacific on a different day or something like an hour earlier. I know it's kind of late for you. Um, it, would that make sense if you guys could type in? Uh, would it make sense to do it instead of 510, maybe do it at four Pacific on a certain day? Um, maybe that would make sense. I, I, might, me I might mess with it. Um, okay. Okay. AJ said, I've been back and forth in NDA for three weeks due to edits on an NDA. Wow. Yeah, you might. That's not good. You, know, you shouldn't beat most companies up, AJ, that much with the NDA situation. They haven't even seen your product yet, you know. Anyway, so I might mess with the time slot to see what works. Um, we've got a decent turnout, but a little less than normal. But I, I remind everybody to take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you guys next time. See you. Bye.